thanks, Matt, for um, asking me to speak. Thanks, Josh and Emad, for helping put this workshop together. Uh, I have to thank Nellen for helping me to be here. <laughs> Nellen's funding the Perseids project. Um, so it's great to be here to talk to you guys. Uh, Matt asked me to highlight how digital tools and technologies are revolutionizing the study of manuscripts, inscriptions, papyri, and so forth. And I have to say that's kind of a daunting task. <laughs> I'm not sure I know how uh, we're revolutionizing anything. But what I do know is what I've, been, what I've learned from the last six years of working with Perseus, uh, building tools and infrastructure to support researchers trying to take advantage of the digital photo work. Uh, so this will be more of a survey of some places we've been with digital manuscripts and uh, a look at where we might be able to go. I have to say, I don't mean to leave anybody out. I know there are many, many more projects than the ones I will show and name here. But um, following some expert advice on how to present a keynote, I choose to focus on the projects I know best. So to, to avoid getting into trouble <laughs> talking about things I don't know. So, so obviously, we're going to start with um, Perseus. Uh, Perseus was for a long time the cutting edge in digital humanities projects and digital manuscripts. Uh, it presented texts, translations, related resources, commentary, all in context with reading aids, search tools, uh, linguistic tools, um, and analytical functionality. And it's, it's still used today, millions of users. Um, but there are some issues with it going forward. It's, it is a closed system. It has very tight coupling between all of its components and its content. Um, and as we move towards uh, more and more distributed systems, uh, this particular architecture that, that um, is behind the, the Perseus project is not one that we can really carry forward. Um, but we can bring its ideas and its content forward, and that's what we've been trying to do at Perseus. Um, the next project. Stay type, get oh. code. <laughs> My phone is talking to me. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> uh, so the next project I want to talk about is the Homer Multitech project and the site architecture. Um, Chris Blackwell and Neil Smith developed the site architecture, which is a rigorous scholarly framework for working with uh, manuscripts, photographs, and images. Um, and really what they did is they gave us a way to think about texts, text passages, images, right. regions of interest on an image. I'm sorry, we have to take my phone and take it far away from me. Stop talking to me. <laughs> it was my voice, apparently. <laughs> um, so, so they gave us a way to think about these things, text, text passages and images, regions of interest on an image, as discrete, nameable, machine actionable, actionable, and citable objects. Um, it has influenced and inspired a tremendous amount of work, including much of my own. Um, an undergraduate student participation is a really essential part of the Homer Multitext, and this is inspirational as well. Um, they have a very tight workflow and a set of tools for working with their manuscripts and data. Um, and it works very, very well for them in their context. And they have done a lot of work to make it reusable by developing machine uh, virtual images of their, of their tools and their workflow support. But it is also a closed system in some ways because it requires adherence to very strict models and a very specific workflow, which may not be appropriate for all texts. Not all texts can be thought of as things that have been canonically cited or will be canonically cited. And this is one of the, the barriers to implementing the model that we've seen. Um, so the next project of, is, I'm going to talk about my project, Perseids. Um, and really, Perseids uh, is an experiment at developing open infrastructure for research, pedagogy, and publication of ancient texts and languages. Uh, we have a heavy focus on reuse, uh, with loose couplings of tools and services. And uh, you know, just about everything that you use on Perseids came from somewhere else. And I'll talk about some of those components a little bit later. Um, we were influenced directly by the Homer Multitext, and one of the motivations for Perseids actually to start was an attempt to, to turn the Homer Multitext work workflow into something that was scalable and more accessible for a wider variety of projects and a lot wider, wider variety of texts. Um, and so as being, being influenced by the Homer Multitext, we have developed support for a CTS-centric publication and annotation model, where you build up a publication of text, a publication made up of a text, a transcription, Maybe a tree bank, a morphosyntactic annotation of a text, a translation alignment, named entity annotation, all of these different things focused and targeting a specific passage or passages of text. And um, you can build publications containing all of these resources or a single type of them. And it, there, there are review workflow support built in for doing the review. And our most commonly uh, used workflow at the moment is tree banking. This is an example of uh, 
doing text and image transcription together. And um, this just shows our publication screen. So um, moving on, then the next project uh, I want to talk about, which is influencing Perseus, but influencing Perseus is the Capital Insightable Text Guidelines and Services Project. This is developed primarily by Tivo Felice at the University of Leipzig, but it's being done collaboratively, collaboratively with us at Perseus. I'm trying to talk a little slower. I know I talk really fast. Um, and Capitans is really the underpinning, underpinnings of what will be the next generation of Perseus, most likely. Uh, it's influenced by the Homer multitext. The CTS uh, uh, standard is foundational for Capitans. Um, it's the design, with the design of Capitans, we attempted to tackle scalability issues with Perseus, particularly around um, how to publish ongoing curated, curated work of text, because this work of digitizing and curating our, our text never ends, and it's constantly going. And one of the really big scalability issues we have with the old Perseus architecture is, is how to get this new work up online as, as soon as it's available. And so a lot of attention in our design for Capitans was focused on that, how to go right from the texts where they're being curated in GitHub to publication, ensuring that uh, the data is high enough quality that it passes through a validation and, and other types of unit tests, but can be instantly made available in whatever you know, curation state it's in. Uh, so some of the cornerstone components of the, the Capitan system are guidelines for how to apply the CTS standard to TIXML and Epidoc XML in particular, and how to set up a repository structure that supports that. Um, it provides a continuous integration environment for ongoing GitHub-based curation of these tests. It provides an abstraction of the CTS model um, and concrete implementations of that model across client and server and multiple program languages. Um, and we're beginning now with um, annotation extensions to use CTS URNs as pivot points so that we can bring in, and the, the, the view is not great here, but you can bring in um, tree banks, uh, other types of annotations based on the CTS URN. So uh, the next project, down through our little survey, the Coptic Scriptorium is a, it's a completely different sort of project. Uh, this is a project led by Carrie Schroeder and Amir Zeldas, and they are uh, working on developing a corpus of Coptic manuscripts. Um, it, it's interesting because unlike Perseus and a lot of other manuscript projects, TEI XML is not their source format. They actually start with their, their text as data in spreadsheets, and then TEI is one of their dissemination formats, which, which is it's just sort of backwards in, in, in the way I had thought about it, but it's, it, you know, it works for their workflow. Um, and they, and particularly because they need to deal with really fragmented text. Their texts are distributed in palaces all physically, and they want to represent that physical distribution in, the, in their digital representation of the project, too. Um, they have a really heavy focus on linguistic annotation, and they make use of the NS query tool for allowing people to query their, their text, and they want particularly to make, the, make sure those analyses that you can do with their tools can be cited, as well as the text themselves. So they put a lot of emphasis on making sure that they had really um, very strong citation guidelines for all of their output, which is very interesting. You can, they, you, you can, they give you guidance on how to cite an analysis, a text, a specific visualization of a text, a specific dissemination. Um, and I worked with them to help them implement the CTS URN identifier model for their text and their text passages, which was really challenging because these texts are not ones which have canonical citations in them, and they are fragmentary texts. So these are two really difficult points, but they, um, the, the, the benefit we gained from using CTS in doing this project was it really forced us to think very rigorously about what we wanted to identify, what were our additions, and how would we deal with different additions, especially if those additions didn't contain the same given the way their, their texts are dispersed. So it, it offered some really interesting challenges to think about. And having that framework of the CTS model did help us to, to situate the questions that we should ask when approaching the data. Um, Digital Athenaeus is another project led by Monica Berti at the University of Leipzig. It deals with uh, fragmentary texts. But uh, this, is, this is an interesting approach because the, unlike, the focus is not on digitizing a specific text, it's, it's on taking an existing text which has been digitized that Athenaeus, I won't be able to say the title of the text, <laughs> so the banquet of the scholars, um, and, and using that as basically a, um, 
enabling source and jumping off point to produce new critical editions of fragmentary texts and lost texts. The Athenaeus text cites many and reuses many texts, some of which are excellent, excellent, some of which are not. And so it presents some really interesting challenges around identification, um, indexing, alignment, visualization, annotation. So these are really the focuses of the project to, to figure out how to produce a new form of critical digital edition that is centered on the source where the, the texts are cited and referenced, but where those texts themselves don't exist. And it's very, and there's some really interesting challenges with it. They use CTF and site as well. Um, but it's, you know, it's not just about manuscripts and it's not just about CTS. Uh, there are many projects dealing with things like McCleary inscriptions. Um, Hughes Project, that Hillary Dead Info, you know, is a foundational project in this field. They, they enable cross project integration of resources from McCleary. They deal with transcription, translation, metadata. Um, for the Puppy Read Info project, they built the Son of Student Online tool, which is a piece of infrastructure uh, that, that is the cornerstone of Percy. It's we've reused it there, and I think it will be the base of the Digital Latin Library too, as for possibly other projects. And um, so I think the Puppy Read Info project is really an exemplary project for how looking at how we deal with ancient texts as linked data, as well as for the infrastructure that they've built to support it. And, and this is, I think, something many projects can learn from in terms of, of the, the structure of how they've approached the, the data. Um, there's also inscription projects. The Attic Inscriptions Online is one that's putting inscriptions online. The inscriptions projects, I think, are many, many more diverse and small and fragmented, maybe sort of reflecting the way study in that field goes. There's I Sicily. Um, and the Eagle Project, which made an attempt to, to provide a portal to all of these inscriptions from various sources, a single search interface, and some interesting tools around social engagement, enabling um, anybody to contribute translations of inscriptions in a wiki sort of way, and their storytelling tool, which allows you to create new stories about inscriptions and combining resources in interesting ways. Um, so, aside from these sorts of projects, which are sort of big, you know, put the text out there, put related resources, put it all in context, there are a lot of other types of digital projects that are enabling and supporting manuscript studies. Um, these are developing t services, tools, repositories for storing the data. And I'll just talk about a few of them. Um, the, the one that we use quite heavily at Perseus and for Perseus is the morphological analysis service uh, that we built actually as part of Project Rangoo and we are still using. We developed an API for a service, a, a web-based service for doing morphological analyses and it has a plugin architecture so that we can plug in different morphological engines on the back end. Um, the work for this was inspired out of the Alpheus project, which is where I work before coming to Perseus. And um, it has, we developed a schema there, which we think is, is extensible enough to support different languages and provide uh, a way to express those analyses, um, regardless of the language. And we currently have this deployed now for Greek, Latin, Arabic, and Persian. Uh, and so it has served as a foundational piece of infrastructure for us because people writing tools to, an anal to use morphological anal analyses across languages can write their, tool their clients once. And, it just works with this API, and, and similarly, we can plug engines in on the back end. So um, it speaks to the power of APIs, I think. Uh, another really important set of tools and services in the classical languages realm is the classical languages toolkit, which is being collaboratively built by a number of people and providing NLP tools, libraries, and services for classical languages. And there are a lot of useful um, things that can be done with this. Uh, another example of a service or tool library is the Logion service built out of the University of Chicago, which is a lexical uh, service for providing access to multiple dictionaries in multiple languages. They have a web-based interface and they put a lot of attention into mobile access as well. Uh, so those are just a few examples of services, tools, libraries that are supporting digital work. Um, another class of tool that I think is really critical, critical for enabling cross-project interoperability are gazetteers. Uh, the Pleiades project was probably the first to really do this, and they do it really well, uh, is to they provide stable identifiers for ancient places and metadata about those places. Um, and they, they, they publish their data in such a way that you can get it in multiple formats. They're very clear about what is in the 
in that data that you'll be able to download it, it really serves as a pivot point between projects. If you're Perseus, we talk about a place named Athens, and I'm Huckberry, we talk about a place named Athens, and, and you know, in another project we do, we can all talk about that place now. We won't identify or know we're talking about the same place and do it in a way that's digitally compatible, which is which is really critical. So um, they, they're really, I think, another foundational project in this space. And they've inspired other work, such as the period O Gazetteer, which is providing unique identifiers for named periods. You know, not everybody agrees what the the Attic period is, or I'll, I'll say them all wrong <laughs> because I'm not a scholar. But you know, the people scholars have different uh, definitions of what uh, an important period of time is, and it also depends on what context you're thinking about, if it's archaeological or or text based. And so they're 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 a gazetteer that's providing uh, uh, unique identifiers for periods, which will also enable this cross project talking between projects about data about periods. If, if my text talks about this period and yours does, we can now be sure that we're talking about it unambiguously. And they've, they've put a lot of thought into figuring out how that information can be reflected in scholarly assertions. Um, and then those projects are also inspiring others like the Syriac.org project, which is developing uh, gazetteers from the Syriac languages, identifiers for places, people, saints, authors, bibliography. Um, so this, this is another resource. And I'm sure there are many, many more resources in this space, but I think that they're, they're really critical for providing that underlying infrastructure for cross-project interoperability in the digital space. Um, and then there are things like annotation tools and analysis tools. A few that we use at Perseus are um, the Arethusa annotation framework, which was developed for tree banking, hopefully is extensible for other types of annotation. It's a client-side framework, which allows you to get data that you want to tree bank from any source and distribute that data to any source. And, and it focuses on what it does best, which is provide an interface for doing this identification of dependencies and morphology. It connects to a lot of services on the back end. So it reuses, for example, the morphology services, you know, the sentence to annotate. It calls out to the morphology service and processes every word in the sentence to offer suggestions. Um, it links to lexical services. It links to Lumion, for example. Um, and uh, it, it provides, uh, con and it connects to Perseids on the back end for storage and management of the data. So tools like this, which are open, that, that focus on a specific um, path, but are open to connect with other, other architectures and other infrastructures, I think are really important. Um, and subsequent to Arethusa, uh, Giuseppe Cilano in Leipzig has developed a tool that takes these the results of the work that's done in these tree banking tools and allows you to analyze inter-annotated inter agreement between the outcomes. So you can do, this is used quite a bit in the pedagogical context to compare a student's annotation with another student's annotation or a student's annotation with the, with the professor's gold standard. But it can also be used for scholarly argument at the, ex, at the expert level too. And by having an open API to the data, it enables people to produce tools like this. Um, if you produce, if you're working on a tool, developing uh, data, and you make that data accessible via, via a clearly defined API, then other researchers can build tools that then can do more and add more functionality. Because that never, even if we wanted to, we did want to provide this functionality in Arthusa, we ran out of time. And just that he was able to build it himself. So I think we need to think that way of how do we enable other people to contribute to our projects as well, or to, to take, take from them and, and move forward with the things we weren't able to do. Um, Alpheus is another tool that we use. This is the translation alignment editor where you can align text of various languages word by word and produce uh, a single annotation. And another really important tool in this space is the Replicato tool being developed by the Palacios project for doing named entity annotation, particularly places, but I think they're expanding now beyond places to people and other types of semantic annotation. And you can load your text into it and annotate it and get your annotations out. They use the open annotation standard for, uh, for expressing their annotations. And um, it's, another, it's another tool that invites and encourages collaboration on annotation in a variety of different contexts. Uh, so, so these are really just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many other types of services and libraries out there, and there are many other types of analyses that are now enabled. Once we digitize our text, once we digitize our images, uh, digitize, you know, the, the, the pic have images that represent those texts and, uh, and other types of objects, and we can do other sorts of analysis 
Um, some examples you know, that I'll just cite are things like topic models, vector space models, stylometry. There's lots of really interesting work being done right now around stylometry. And these are building on other types of digital, you know, not only the text themselves, but the true bits that we produce with the text. So they, they layer on top of each other to enable more and more types of new forms of analysis. Prosopography, social networks is another area of, of a lot of active work right now. And, and, and identifying instances of text reuse. And the text reuse is a really interesting area for cross language study. We were talking earlier about how you know how words have to be communicated and back and forth. And, and uh, I think once once we have our text digitized, then we can really begin to start to, to answer those questions in a way that we weren't able to before. Um, and you know, ideally, some or all of these outputs that we're talking about will eventually be preserved, whether in institutional repositories or in domain-specific repositories. We're working with Tufts right now to figure out how the data we produce on proceeds can be preserved in the Tufts Digital Archive. There are not a lot of general purpose repositories out there for humanities data like there are in the sciences, but there's the new MLA Core, which is a, which is a repository that's looking to, to help people preserve the humanities data. I'm sure there are others. There's the uh, universes of data repositories out there and things, but but really we need to, we should all be thinking about when we're producing an analysis, whether it's just one or hundreds, how are we going to preserve that in, in our institutions and in our repositories? Um, but, you know, what I've talked about so far has all, are, are a lot of projects that have required a lot of resources, both financial resources, human resources, technical resources. There, there are large self-contained projects in a lot of ways that, um, that, that require uh, quite a bit of investment. And if you're starting out, it's not clear, you know, do you have those resources available to you? How, you? how can you start? And so I think it's really important to look at what's at the other end of that spectrum. Because there are tools out there more and more that are about enabling anybody to get up and start with publishing a digital collection, publishing a text. And we'll look at some of those a bit later in the day. A couple that I want to mention right now are uh, Omeka, which is a tool for building collections and exhibits around collections. There are, there's work right now going on, uh, I believe, with the University of Toronto and Penn to enable it for really being able to work in manuscripts in Omeka, which has not been done too much so far. Um, I did find one manuscript project online when they're done all projects. But, um, you know, it, it's really about, it's built on uh, tools like, I think it's built on Drupal, and it, it's really about, you know, Low, low barrier to entry in terms of building a collection. They, they put a lot of attention into metadata and making the data accessible via good, citable guidelines. Um, and another interesting approach is to just put your text and data into GitHub and build up uh, publications using these free GitHub pages tools. Ed is one theme out there that can be applied to, uh, to manuscript type text and make it presentable very easily. That's meant to make this really accessible for people that just don't have any, any resources at all for doing this, but they can put their, their, their data in a free GitHub uh, repository, make some nice uh, presentations of it, and um, get it out there for people to use. And I have not talked about images much at all, but images are obviously a really important piece. Matt brought it up earlier. And um, more and more, we want to be able to connect our Im images of our text or images of other things to uh, the text. And the IIIF standard uh, has been enabling that. And there are now solutions out there that allow you to get much started much more easily with IIIF. There's the Try IIIF app, which allows you to take your, to just point at an image anywhere, and, and it gives you in that IIIF API access to that so that you can begin to see how using IIIF enables annotation and citation of images. Um, and there are hosting services as well, like the IIF hosting. And this is not an advertisement for any of these, but just to, to say that there are tools out there that are low barrier to entry to getting up and using, using standards um, without requiring huge technical infrastructure behind you to get started. And we, I think we need more of those in a, in a variety of different areas. Um, but, uh, you know, the question is really for me is that is there some sort of middle ground between these really development heavy custom projects and these very general purpose solutions which maybe don't support all our workflows and use cases? The GitHub pages approach to publishing a text is really nice, but what about images? The Omeka approach to public, publishing a collection is really great, but how do I really do fine grain work with manuscripts working in the text in, in Omeka? 
And um, so one of the things that, you know, that we'd like to think about here in these next couple days is, is there some sort of middle ground solution where, uh, where we can, can get the best of a few different worlds. Uh, one approach that we could consider might be shared, collectively built, and maintained libraries, which work with data kept in open repositories like GitHub that can easily be pieced together to provide functionality for things like annotation and cross-linking of resources. And I'll posit one possible approach. I, I'm not sure it's viable, but it's it's just one, one way to think about this and sort of give you an idea of how I might think about it if I was to try to start it. We could take things like the Capitan's guidelines, which provide you very clear guidelines for how to, to uh, make your XML text citable, how to put it in a repository that can be tested, and APIs for getting access to those, those text passages programmatically so that you can, can provide a URL that says, give me this passage line 1.1 .1 of the Iliad. For example, and how to do how to apply that not just to the person's text but all your texts. So that's one potential component in this sort of middle ground solution. Another important one would be present presentation of the of the text and the Statistician library that you and, and Rafa are, are building uh, is is a really interesting approach where they're taking um, and turning TIXML itself into HTML that can be displayed directly in the browser by treating the, the TIXML as web components just like HTML does. And if anybody here has tried to work and build a style sheet to do a transform from XML to HTML, you know this is a really difficult process. It can be difficult and it can be a barrier to entry, both to XML and to publishing. But um, the question is whether these types of JavaScript libraries which, which treat the XML directly natively as, as uh, viewable, operable text in the browser can help reduce that barrier to entry to publishing your XML text. So allowing you to do the really fine grained markup that XML and TDI give you, but turning that into also something that's visible and usable for the end user without a huge amount of work. And I think um, this is a really promising approach. So it's just an example of a Vivo text TA XML that they have that, that she has put up on this on that page that that you know is just displaying it directly. There's no transform. And, and, and I think it's really worth considering this approach. Uh, and then there's tools for annotation. The hypothesis tool um, is enabling to annotation on any text anywhere in the web by building the annotation functionality directly into your browser. You, it loads as a plugin, or you know you can follow a link that enables it from your page, and you immediately can begin to annotate passages, selections of passages, individual words in your text, and um, those annotations get associated with your identity. You can share them. You can make them public. You can not public, there's group functionality around them, and there's also APIs so that you can access those, those annotations um, from your own, from other, from other systems. We, we, we did a really interesting experiment with Hypothesis and Perseids where we had students annotate the Smith's uh, Dictionary of Greek Mythological Characters, and um, they, they identified, we used the SNAP ontology for them to identify relationships between People, so you know, Zeus and Hera, their relationship, and so forth. And then um, we had them just do that with hypothesis, and then we use the hypothesis API to extract out that annotation data to convert it into a format that was that applied our identifiers and standards, and then present it for display. And it was, it was, we learned a lot from that, and I think there's a lot more that can be done with tools like hypothesis. But it is not really intended for semantic annotation. Um, it's more of a freeform text and tag based. So we've also been working on building flow from those. Uh, Project Baumgart is the developer at Perseids who's working on this. And it's, it's, it's a basically a JavaScript set of libraries for doing semantic annotation on texts. Um, and so this could be another sort of component, mixing and matching these things, hypothesis for, for more freeform annotation, Locomos possibly for doing semantic social network annotations. This is just an example where this is sort of what we've learned from our attempt to use hypothesis for social network annotation, uh, not having a visualization that allowed you see that, to see the directionality of the relationships and the graph as you were building it was really hampering our ability to produce good data. So that's what led into the production of this tool. Um, so I think that there, there, there are not one single solution for all of these things, but there are ways to combine them that might might work and might give us a good portion of what we need in a more flexible way than the solutions that are built for a single use case. Uh, another example are the browser-based Alpha's tools that we build that will provide a text analysis and reading aid. These are now undergoing a, a renewal with um, uh, 
Elijah is helping us with that and building, uh, turning them into shared JavaScript libraries that kids can use with Percy as kids use in the digital Latin library and provide access to services like the morphological analysis service to sort of provide reading aids on any text anywhere. Um, and there, there are other, you know, dictionary lookup services, uh, various other types of uh, uh, we have like inflection tables that we might present this way, that sort of thing. So these are more for the for the public use of the of the data, but they're they're important nonetheless, and they're an important piece of what Percy has always provided in a tightly coupled way that we would like to go to do in a much more open way to enable that sort of functionality, not only just for Perseus but other projects. Um, and then on the image front, there are tools like Mirador, which are JavaScript-based tools for browser-based uh, access to image. Of viewing and annotation. And these are a critical piece. We have to get to the point where we can mix and match our text based tools with the image tools. And I think that uh, tools like Mirador would be an important component. And I cannot speak very specifically about Mirador, but there are people here who will be able to talk about it more later. Um, but, you know, this is all really appealing to me as a developer and a technical person because I can think about how to put these pieces together, right? And, I, you know, I can see the possibilities, but that's not. It's, we, we still come up against that that, strain, that same limitation um, where it requires technical skills. And you know, one one other thing to think about with this approach is that browser browser technology is changing so fast that the libraries will still require ongoing development to sustain. It's not realistic to think I'm going to build the perfect solution and it's going to it's going to stay there and work forever. We're seeing that already with our Arthur, where we built it on. You know, a framework Angular, which is now out of date and has been, you know, we can't and our dependencies are, you know, more than every time we build that the Rabbit say, you know, we're gonna blow up soon. So you know, this is things we have to think about. And, and you know, and even in that sort of nice mix and match solution, we, there are still ongoing sustainability and maintenance issues. I think if we are working on shared libraries, they become they, it becomes more tractable, right? If the digital Latin library and Perseus are both using Palkia's reading aids, we can both contribute resources to maintain. What's, that's what sort of what we're experimenting with right now. So it, it's I, I don't think we should throw this idea out the window, but I think we also have to recognize that it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all the problems, and it's not going to take away the need for technical skills and ongoing maintenance. Um, and you know, and then another another thing that we've learned from Percy is sort of the hard way is that this mix and match doesn't really always work for your users, right? You go, this tool does not look anything like this tool, and this tool has a different you know workflow set of paradigms to the other one. And mixing and matching these together, while it saves time on development in some ways, it makes for a really difficult user experience. And that's something we have to keep in mind as the experience of the end user. And I think it was Nikki that said to me, you know, we don't want to be building Frankenstein <laughs> tools. <laughs> and you know, I do sometimes feel that Percy is a bit like the Frankenstein monster. So so I do and, you know, and I, I tend to, to minimize the need for for pretty interfaces and stuff, but they are important when it comes to usability, if, especially if you don't have those technical skills to understand, you know, the behind the scenes, these are really the same. Uh, so so that, that's really what brought us to here today, is, is to, to, to see if we could answer this question, is an in ultimate infrastructure for digital manuscripts really possible? One that, that is easy for people to use, um, and which solves some of these, these ongoing and difficult issues. Um, and I think that while we might not get fully there, that we can do a whole lot better than we are right now, and that there really are many more commonalities between the use cases and solutions than there are differences. There are commonalities across use cases and needs, but there's also commonalities across existing implementations, even if it doesn't look like it at the, at the surface. Many of these applications are doing the same things. They're doing them in slightly different ways, but the underlying components and the functionality that they're and you know what we think is unique to our own project may really not be, and they may not even be unique to manuscripts, and it may not even be, be unique to the humanities. There may be, and I believe there really are, many commonalities between what we're doing in manuscripts and what they're doing in climate science, for example. Um, and so I think what we need to do is we have to be much better at identifying what is common and what is project specific. And um, you know, at the base of all of this is we need infrastructure for our data. And I think humanists are not always used to thinking about what they're doing in terms of data. But it really is, right? Manuscripts, authors, places, images, lexical tokens, 
morphological analyses, annotations, these are all data. And they're the same at their very core as the data that the climate scientists or the biologists are producing. There are things that we need to talk about, identify, name, and share. And they build, we combine them together to produce new knowledge. Um, so start with the data, I think, is really you know, where we have to be in terms of starting with an old, building an ultimate infrastructure. And you know, as we do this, and these are questions that we, we talked about earlier today, right? What, what we need to keep in mind at this, during this process, really, are what what are our goals for use of the digital? We should always be asking us asking asking that of ourselves. We shouldn't use the digital just for the sake of it. We need to, it needs to be solving a, a specific goal for us, um, and we need to to think very carefully about how to make our work persistent and preservable. And it doesn't mean that we have to know the answers to that at the start of our project. You know, raised earlier that you know it can be daunting if you wait till you have all the answers you'll never get started. You have to start, but but this should at least be in the back of your mind when you start a project is how how am I going to make sure that I can preserve this and persist it? Um, and what are our identifiable data objects? What are the things that I need to talk about that I want to be able to use in my work but also allow other people to be able to cite and point at and to be able to connect? And how how can we ensure that our data is understandable both by humans and machines? We make something that's completely opaque to the human, it's going to be really hard, especially if the machine format has changed completely, you know, five years from now. And and vice versa, if it's if it's understandable by a human but not by a machine, then it can't participate in the digital ecosystem. So so these are really just underlying tenets that I think we should think about when talking about building infrastructure. So what what does infrastructure for data really mean? What does it look like? And I'm gonna, this is a, a diagram that actually comes out of the Data Fabric Interest Group of the Research Data Alliance, which is a, a, a initiative that I've been involved in and that I've learned a tremendous amount from. And it's a global multidisciplinary initiative to really to think about building the social and technical bridges for infrastructure for data. And it's where um, there's a lot of very interesting cross-disciplinary work going on. And how, having this opportunity to talk across disciplines about data needs helps you to really see that there are tremendous commonalities. This is a, a, a workflow for building collections that I think was built, you know, originally for a scientific uh, use case, but I think it should look really familiar to anybody here who's built a collection, right? You need, you, 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 you say, I have a new collection that I want to organize. I want to register it somewhere. I want to describe what this collection is going to hold. I want to make sure I can store and preserve the contents of it. I need to discover what is going into the collection. I need to plan how it's going to come together. I want to make sure the, the things in my collection can integrate with other things, can interoperate with other projects. I want to be able to do processing on my collection. And then I want to maybe turn that into a new collection. Right? And the data may come from various sources from my collection. It may come from things like in the scientific world, it might come from sensors and tools. In the humanities world, it might come from services or even manual processes. Um, but you know, so ultimately, it's all the same. These things are going discrete, identifiable objects and pieces of data that are going into a collection. And then, in the end, we want to publish our collection. We want to be able to extract knowledge from it, extract new knowledge from it, and we want to enable people to cite it, and we want to reorganize it. And you know, it's sort of a virtuous circle of ongoing. And this, this, this process is not unique to any one discipline, but it is, you know, it's something that that is really tangible about. Um, working with data and collections provide context and 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 having tools and apis and services for working with our collections i i, I believe this is one of the things that can be done at, at a really low level that we shouldn't all be reinventing each time we build a digital project uh, i'm just that's the source for our diagram here so so what are some of these common components that we need to think about persistent identifiers for our data are one uh, formalizing our data types so that we know what this piece of data is. This is something that, that you know, that the Gladys project does very well is to, to be very expressive about the faces and what we can expect to be in them. And we need to have many more formalizations of the types of data. What is this manuscript? What is this image? And what are the properties I can expect it to have? Uh, we need standards for representing our metadata. This came up earlier too, that there, there are not clear standards always, but there, there can be, and there are many that do exist. Uh, we need tools and services for managing our content. We need tools and services for managing our collections. And we need to do search and indexing. 
We need brokers that can mediate between different services and between different projects and different standards. And we need repositories. And these are, these are core data needs that are not discipline specific. They definitely speak to needs in the humanities, they speak to needs in, in many, many disciplines. And, and these are the components I think we really need to be focusing on um, for when we, when we say, what, what can we share and what should we not be building over and over again? So this, these are some of the things that are the focus of the work that we're doing in the RDA. Um, there are some common data types and metastator standards in, in our own domain in the humanities, in the text, even the manuscript study for PIDs. I think there's you know a handful of things that we're using. We use handles. DOIs, which are a form of handle, ARCs, URNs, and URLs. And you know, there are probably, you know, there are other types of IDs you can think about, but when, when it comes to persistent IDs, these are really um, at the top of the list. For text, we are all using TIX and ML, or many of us are, and this, and I, this was one of the, the surprises from the survey results for me, is just really how prevalent TEIX and ML is for text. And it is, it is a standard that's, you know, it's maddening in some ways because it allows you to do so much. And so you can do things in many different ways. But there are approaches like the Epidoc consortium, which say this is how we're going to use TEI for our for our project. And and I think it's it's you know it's a standard that we, we can't ignore. But you know, we also do need to think about other approaches like markdown and CSV. These are these are the projects that we talked about that I talked about earlier, these are important formats. And getting from one to the other, whichever one is the source, is important. Um, for images, I think you know IIIF has clearly uh, you know become very prevalent as a standard, and, and it provides both an API for accessing the images, for citing regions of interest, and a manifest for a, a structure for for creating a canvas on which images are combined with you know other types of data. Um, so it's a standard we have to pay attention to and try to make the most of using. For annotations, there was the Open Annotation Standard, which is now morphing into the W3C Annotation Standard. And um, there are many other ways to reflect annotations. You know, for example, for our tree banks, we use a schema, but then we can serialize our annotations and wrap them up in the, 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 the open annotation format. I use open annotation in the morphology service. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily say, we can't say that, you know, the W3C annotation specification answers every single specific annotation need, but it is very useful for interoperability. and and communication about annotations. Uh, and on the metadata front, you know, this is where you know, we start to diverge, but there are some clear winners, right? There's Dublin Core for, for general bibliographic and, and cataloging metadata. There's Prog for, for describing provenance. Open annotation itself is a metadata standard. CDOC, everybody's favorite. <laughs> LOD, which is the, the, the work that, that Hugh's been doing in the link with ancient world data. SNAP is a, is, a, is a metadata standard for describing provenance. There, there are many others, but I think that there are, are probably uh, some key ones that we can agree on and use as a starting point. Um, there will always be a need for transformations and crosswalks on metadata. To, I think to expect that we're going to have one single metadata standard that everybody's happy with is, is, is probably not realistic. But, but, if, but, but by, by defining standards and saying explicitly, this is what I mean when I say this, it enables those crosswalks. So we can't, we can't disregard the need for, for those standards. And then the last piece of infrastructure for data that I think is really important here are APIs, which are enabling machine access to the data. So there's a IIIF API for enabling access to images and regions of interest on the image. For text and annotations, this is one of the really um, core pieces of infrastructure that I think for multi Homer Multitext was very innovative in providing, which is an API for retrieving passages of text, named identified passages of text, so that you can turn that home ill 1.1 into something machine actionable that anybody can know how to retrieve and get the, the data out. There are some limitations with CTS, namely that not everything is canonically citable. Not, there is not a home ill 1.1 for every type of text and you know the APIs themselves maybe need some refreshing. So we've been this has been a participatory effort to build the DTS uh, standard, which is distributed text services. A number of us here, Hugh, Jeff, others have been participating in it. And we're, we're, we're trying to see, can we, can we come up with an API for working with text and passages of text that is general enough, but still useful enough to en enable that? And this, this effort is both being informed by the work 
of the RDA collections working group and informing it. So one of my most optimistic moments was when I presented the work we had done for describing a text as a, co a collection of texts to this work this multidisciplinary working group. And the, eight, the operations that we had identified for dealing with our texts were the same operations that the climate scientists want for dealing with their collections. And so I really think we're getting somewhere here, especially on the collect I think collections, thinking about texts as collections, collections of text, but even a text itself as a collection of passages is something that we, that we can do, and we can do this in a multidisciplinary way. And, and once we have some services for doing this that, that, that are used uh, globally across disciplines, then we don't have to build this anymore. <laughs> and we can work about, we can, we can think about the, the things that are really specific to our discipline and our, and our work. Um, and there's APIs for dealing with persistent identifiers and data types. These are some of the APIs that are coming out of the RDA. There's a pet API for, for for providing that, an abstraction on top of different persistent identifier types. There's a data types registry API for providing an API for, for retrieving and describing machine actionable data types. Um, where we may uh, run into difficulty coming up with more general solutions are workflow tools. We need tools for curation, for annotation, for analysis, for visualization, for publication. There's others that we need, but these are some of the, the key categories. Um, and I'm not sure that we can get to the point where we have tools that, that do everything for everybody, and, and, and if that's even really a desirable place to get. Um, and these, these are, this is the aspect of infrastructure that I think is also really heavily impacted by the rate of technological change. It's closest to the user, and this is where change happens really rapidly with browsers and devices. But, um, but if we're all using the same underlying, underlying components like the service like uh, APIs for, for identifying and typing our data, then building these becomes a much more practical, practical problem and we can put more resources into building really nice tools that deal with specific use cases and less resources into to rebuilding the same components that are underlying. And if we use standards both in terms of the way we describe our data and our identifiers and standards for the APIs that, that speak to the data at the lower level, then my project and my tool can interoperate with your project and your tool. And that's really where I think we need to get. And then, you know, we'll also be in a better place to, to maintain those tools together. I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not talking so fast. That it's about 18 to uh, Okay, so. Oh, so I need to talk much faster if we're going to have time for questions. So, you know, because I'm here, you know we're going to ask, can we start from something that exists? Because this is really, really where I always started. Can I reuse something? Because I don't want to build it myself from scratch. Um, and so that's really where we're here. Why what we're going to do today is we're going to analyze some existing tools. Uh, th this is not a comprehensive look at the tools. We've just picked a few that uh, approach a few of the different use cases we've identified. Um, and not any one of these tools was probably developed intending to be the be-all, end-all solution for everybody. But they provide an interesting solution to some, and for that reason, they're worth looking at a little bit more closely. So we're going to look at the collective access tool later today. The VHIML um, project is going to come talk to us about their tool, for, which, is, which is about cataloging collections, transcriptions, images. Um, we're going to look at the Scriptorium tool, which is about image transcription, more, more focused on image transcription, I think, than on text. But again, these are tools I haven't really investigated myself yet, so I may be sending something that's completely wrong about them. Uh, the Getty Scholars Workspace, which is a manuscript research environment. Uh, we were hoping to look at EBT. It may not be ready for us to look at yet. They're currently working on their beta, but this is a very interesting tool for working across editions and providing visualization and curation to technology. We're also going to maybe look at some from some institutional level repositories like Fedora, Island Dora, and Hydrogen Box. And we've identified some questions that we're going to ask of these tools. Uh, we're going to ask what use cases they're intended to support, try to, try to explore what use cases of workflows they might be capable of supporting. We're going to look at whether any of the gaps can be filled by combining tools. Um, and we're going to look at how they deal with data management best practices. And hopefully at the end of this, um, will be in a better position to answer this question of what's next and where do we need to go next. So I think since I'm out of time, I'll stop now. Uh, the, my final slide, I'm sure that the slides will be published, but um, 
this is also, if you want to take a picture of it or whatever, this is all the projects that I've referenced. Hopefully I didn't miss any uh, with links to where you can find them and my contact information. So thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> So there's text that's been gone, gone through uh, OCR, optical processing, optical character recognition. There's lots of mistakes. The machine may get its best guess of trying of identifying what characters were there, but it made mistakes. So one aspect of curation is just that really tedious bit of correcting it. But there's also you know things like adding additional context information and identifying when you need to place it. Sure. Oh yes, yeah, sure, sure. Sorry. So identifying the places and marking and, and marking those up in your text, for example, you know, adding markers around your name and entities, among your people and your places, saying that this this is what this word represents. There's a lot of different aspects to curation. Even doing things like very detailed uh, morphosyntactic um, analysis can be thought of curation. And then once you once you build something digital, right, then you can curate that further. If I do an analysis, a tree bank, a dependency diagram of a sentence, somebody else may say, you know, you got this one wrong. So that's another form of curation. Cataloging, adding metadata, all of that are prospects of curation. I want to ask a fundamental question. Yeah. You don't have to answer it. No. Um, but it, it, it kind of it, it occurs to me remotely, and maybe I try not to make assumptions about this because I don't want to make any assumptions about this. But I wonder about um, sort of a more meta level what about support for the people? Building these tools, what what sorts of um, social infrastructure do we need um, to enable people to keep working on this kind of stuff? How do we foster the collaborations between people um, who are who are able to develop um, tools um, so that they can build new things? Um, how do we not keep people sort of siloed um, and bring these developers? We, we, you know, the question of like faculty support, um, getting tenure and all that keeps coming up. Um, we did earlier this morning. Um, selfishly, I wonder, you know, faculty wonder how they can reproduce themselves. Selfishly, I, I wonder how can I reproduce myself? You and I are in very privileged positions that we want to collaborate with some. Yeah. Well, it's a really good question. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have many answers to it. I, I do think that. That we need more organizations like you know, the Research Data Alliance is one that I've been able to participate in, and it's really important because it's enabled me to collaborate with people across disciplines, but that have similar problems. And we need organizations like that that are multidisciplinary, but we also need more opportunities for us within the same very focused discipline to work together. And we need the, the institutions to recognize that this is an investment that they have to make if they want to support this type of project. But it's not that we're also not. Um, Disposable, right? That there's a tremendous knowledge that builds up in your resource, and it's not like you could just say, "Give me any programmer, and they can come in and do this task." You know, th there has to be recognition of that, and, and so yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I agree, it's a, I agree, it's a good problem to think about. when you're actually 
actually bring people together, maybe in simple brown bags or whatever, but bringing people together to actually see how much they realize in each other and the environment. Uh, there's a young mother school in the But it gets back to the point that we raised earlier is that those things don't currently contribute to tenure or don't contribute enough to tenure. So it's additional work that they have to do. And so it, you know, it, it's both, it goes both ways. But I think we need recognition on, on both sides that that's the, that this is a problem. Entirely, but that's you know we need to be at that point where we're using humans for the things that humans can do that computers can't. We use the computers to do the things that the computers can do, but it's really inefficient and boring for the humans to do, right? And so yeah, exactly what you said. We have tools that can go and, and do this OCR, and then we can use humans to do the fine grain. Not, not to use humans. <laughs> that's a really horrible way to put it. But you know, you know. But but again, you know, developing the infrastructure enables that, right? Because just as humans can produce data to meet the standards, so can machines. And if we're all producing data in the same way, then, then we can actually think about doing that in, in a much more reasonable way. <laughs> Just uh, want to bring up like afterwards, and I think it's back to from where I heard it, but somebody made the comment that data ages like wine, software ages like fish. That's <laughs> 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 really wonderful. <laughs> I think that's very, very true in this context. I think we should focus on why. I agree, that's all. I think that's a good way to end the talk. <laughs>